Hello and welcome to another episode of Well Capitalized. I'm your host, Bobby Kingsbury, Managing Director at MCM Capital Partners. And today we're gonna to be continuing our education on the due diligence process. Uh, and today we have with us Kelly Lamran from KeyBank talking about uh, bank diligence. So Kelly, thank you very much for, for joining Thanks us Thanks for today. having me. Yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind, just give us a little bit of background on yourself and then sure. maybe Key and then we can start, start from there. Sure, uh, so Kelly Lamran, I'm the regional credit exec at um, at Key Bank, and I've been there for coming up on 22 years. So I've been there my whole career. I started at Key right out of college. I went to Miami University. Uh, I started there in their credit training program um, and did, did a bunch of training th all throughout the summer and then got into the middle market space as an analyst. I took a sidestep into the corporate bank for a couple of years. I hated that job, <laughs> and then I came back to the middle market. Um, as an associate for a couple of years and then uh, got my credit authority about 17 years ago and so I was a junior credit officer and I've just expanded my credit role uh, throughout the years from the Cleveland market, you know, Cleveland and Akron and Columbus and now I have a team of folks that help me manage middle market credit for the Great Lakes which for key is all of Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan. So it's a lot of windshield time for <laughs> me, but, but that, that sets and us up. cold good. weather states. Yes, yes, you know. But so how does Key, um, just for the viewers at home, how does Key define the, the middle market? What size businesses are you typically underwriting? Uh, Key defines the middle market from about 10 million in revenue mm -hmm. to about a half a billion. And th the majority of our borrowers fall in that 10 to, I would say, less than 100 million in revenue. The outliers of the big companies, they, there are a, a handful of them, but in terms of volume, it's, it's definitely at in that 10 to less than $100 million revenue space. Great, you know, that's all of the stuff up front, you know, and that's very helpful on, uh, on the diligence side. What about after the transaction? You know, what, what repo reporting requirements do, uh, or reporting does KeyBank require? Uh, it, it, it depends a little bit, um, but for the most part, we will require quarterly financial statements with a compliance certificate certified by the CFO. And the reason for that is we really want <coughs> owners and everyone to know what is in the documents. And so uh, they, they need to be aware of their covenants and their, their uh, performance against those covenants. It, we don't ever want to, it to say, well, you know, to come to the borrower and say, well, you were in default. And they would say, well, what covenant? You know, so we, we want them to be cognizant of that uh, so that we're all on the same page. And also we want our calculations to match. Sometimes, you know, people, go th run through the calculation and they come up with something different than we do and there can be nuances in, in those definitions so we want to make sure that that our, our calculations match and that's the point of that compliance certificate. Um, we'll want like I said quarterly financials and, and audit generally speaking once um, it flips and there's more leverage on the business the, re the statement requirements will in increase to an audit which matches with I'm sure what yes. your you know you, what your LPs want out of that as well. Um, Depending on the business, we could require a borrowing base, making sure that the working capital assets match up with what's borrowed on the line mm -hmm. or the revolver. That can be hit or miss. It depends on how working capital intensive the business might be. If it's just, if all there are receivables and there really isn't any inventory, you know, uh, you know, that reporting means a little bit less at that point. Um, and I also try to tell my team, and we believe that making sure that we're not just asking for paper. You know, I, I don't want a bunch of information Numbers that I need to yeah. check a bunch, bunch of boxes and stuff that people aren't going to read, you know. Uh, but we put in our documents that at any time we could request y additional items as if an, an AR aging, so mm -hmm. a receivables aging, or maybe an inventory report, or a payables aging. Uh, you know, I generally don't like to see those on a monthly basis unless there's a need for that. but. Uh, I, we, we would put in our documents that at any time we could request that. And, and we'll probably spot check it once a year when we do an annual review, but it doesn't necessarily need to be part of the, a monthly package. Okay. So and then who, who is generally speaking with the bank from the company? Who, who, who is the bank working with? Is it generally, are they working with the private equity firm or are they usually working with the controller CFO? It's the controller CFO, you know, if they need some help, um, we gen we will go to Kevin. Usually mm -hmm. does a really great job of putting a package together. 
uh, a template, if you will, for the CFO or controller because he knows exactly what we like to see and how we like to see it. So the formatting is the same. Um, so that that's helpful, uh, but not required. And but you know we look for someone in the controller CFO position to be able to put those reports together and really to put them together in a timely manner. Um, so we just need to make sure that we're checking those within kind of 45, 60 days of quarter end. If you're getting them any later than that, you know, it, sometimes that's a problem. The old yeah. adage is that sometimes bad news travels slowly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we need to make sure that we know know what's your client, on. know what's going on with your borrower. Right. And I, yeah, I know when we were talking, we were sharing some stories, and one of the questions that uh, came up from some business owners was, who is responsible for paying the debt? Well, the business is responsible. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not the private equity firm. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean the business. The business repays the debt, yeah. and it's no, it's not the private equity firm. But you know, it, we need to make sure that we have a good relationship with the private equity firm, that they are able to help a company and navigate if there are any problems, or also to come to us when there's growth scenarios as well. This, you know, that growth eats cash. You know, so yeah. we need to make sure that the business is in, in good shape. But going back to the whole character. You know, one of my mentors early on in my career told me uh, companies don't repay loans, people do. And so we really need to make sure that we're, we're banking the right people. Mm -hmm. Because we will go through another recession. No yeah. Nobody, obviously nobody knows when. I keep hearing the, you know, we're in the seventh inning of a nine inning game and we've been there for a handful of years now. Yeah. And not that anyone's looking forward to a recession, but we need to make sure that we're with the right people that'll help us navigate through that and that support their businesses. And um, I mean, I've been parts of deals where that hasn't happened and it's, it's really tough. Yeah. It's really tough and it doesn't feel very good. Well, so I, I think that's a, a good transition to another question, probably what's on some uh, business owners' minds is, you know, during recession or, you know, what if I, I, I have a terrible year, you know, and I'm missing my, my debt covenants? Mm -hmm. What happens? So, you know, like I said, those are meant to bring us back to the table. And what I always look for, and it's a big benchmark for us, is that, okay, I can't do anything about the history, right? I, I'm not yeah. carrying around uh, terrible quarters going forward, but can management and the company adjust that they can cover their, their fixed charges going forward? So maybe not on a trailing 12-month basis, which is something that we look for, but what is the outlook? Can they right-size things so that for then, okay, so then for the, the March quarter, they were fixed charge positive, and then we'll add another quarter onto that and another quarter onto that. So we will, and off, sometimes we have to do that. Yeah. We have to reset things. They had um, a lawsuit or I don't know, something really bad happened in that quarter. But what we're looking for then is, okay, can they fix that and can they right size that? Um, if things get really bad and they can't do that, there are other agreements that could take place. We'll reserve our rights saying, hey, we're not going to do anything for right now but we reserve our rights to do something going forward. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a very, there's a lot of things that could happen during and that and period. And more, more often than not, you're trying to work oh, of course. With, with the company yeah. more than anything. Right, you know, so that will get down to a waiver, you know, a, or a waiver and an amendment. So sort of what I was talking about before in terms of not carrying around some old quarters, we're, but we have to make sure going forward we're in, we're in a good Compliance. headspace, yeah. and that will require an amendment. But you know, we just need to know the information, and we need to be able to work with you to, to you know, with your team as well as, as the management team of the um, of the portfolio company to assure that things are on the right track. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've worked through a couple of situations yeah, like that. So we have. And fortunately, they've they've worked out. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. But you know, there it's been a good relationship. And it, it has been. We're we're very grateful. Uh, so are we. And then uh, from a, a business owner standpoint, some, you know, uh, prior to sale might be using more of a community bank, mm -hmm. you know, with th they've had a relationship, they started, you know, backing them when they were extremely small. Now, moving forward, it's a more institutionalized bank. What, what, what are the benefits of, you know, working with a, a, a larger institution like Key? Um, well, 
the relationship that, that we have with you guys is, is one of definitely one of the benefits. We also have our capital markets folks who have industry expertise that we leverage. Uh, and we could make lots of introductions to help grow that business. Let's say that there's uh, another client or, or somebody else in the industry, we can help provide a lot of that knowledge. Our products and services are, generally speaking, a lot more technologically advanced as well. He's invested a lot in uh, technology platforms. Uh, our our treasury services are better. We really, you know, we really try to. Uh, we've invested a lot in the in those platforms, so y which can speed up your cash cycle, which saves you some money. Right. L less paper, more fraud protection. That you know, um, I sat through which a. Which is happening more and more. I know. Unfortunately, I sat through a fraud presentation last week, and um, it was uh, a woman in the fraud group from Grant Thornton. She said she'd never put her money in a, in a savings and loan. She said that, um, or a credit union, I think was probably what she said. Yeah, it was a credit union, not a savings and loan. But a credit union, just because she said that's just too much paper floating around and mm -hmm. it's account numbers are out there and the, the protections and services just, just aren't as great and fraudsters prey on that kind of stuff. Yeah. You it's know, so. It's a dangerous time that it really <laughs> is. we're living in. It, yeah, it, it really sure. is. But, you know, we've got, We've got, um, you know, s technology to help combat that as well. So, you know, that we, we encourage all that mm -hmm. protection because that can be significant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we also, that's part of diligence too that we ask about, not necessarily that we... Um, Perform. Pr yeah, but yeah. We, we definitely ask about your cybersecurity and systems and whatnot. I mean, that's meaningful because that can interrupt your cash flow. Yeah. You know, it can interrupt the performance when... Uh, you, you've had a, a big fraud where, you know, ransomware is huge now, too. And so we, we really want to, yeah, we really need to make sure that uh, companies have the right securities in their own systems to prevent that from happening. Yeah. And we're actually going to do a video, you know, in all portions of the diligence. And uh, one of them happens to obviously be, be IT. Is that something that we look at more and more now? Absolutely. Uh, you have to. In detail. And s so the... The point of all these is is business owner education, and then I, I would love for you to leave the business owners with uh, some piece of advice on how to prepare, you know, as they go to exit from a bank diligence standpoint. What can they do to prepare themselves? Uh, they can make sure that their financial reporting is in good shape. Um, a lot of the times, they may their controller, whatnot, or bookkeeper, even if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, make sure that they have a good education process and that you bring them up to speed on what's going to be expected because the last thing we want to do is close and then turn to say, okay, well, where was the where are the financial statements and, and the covenant compliance and, or the receivable aging or whatever, and the controller was like, what? Yeah. You know, like, well, I didn't know I had <laughs> to do that or what, you know, so walking through some of the calculations and what is expected just to make sure that the reporting is in good shape. Um, and I really encourage business owners to ask as many questions as of us as they want or can, uh, things that they think of. And even after the process, like I don't, I don't want it, we never want it to be where, you know, we close and then they never hear from us again. Yeah. That's, you know, that's not the way it is and, and, and it hasn't been, but they should feel free and we encourage them to form relationships with the bank as well because we can help in a lot of different categories. And, you know, we're there to make sure that, that, that it goes well. Yeah. Well, Kelly, thank you so yeah, much for taking the for time. I really me. enjoyed it. And yeah. I think the business owners will get a lot yeah. out of it. So thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, no, thank you. I yeah. appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time to watch another episode of Well Capitalized. Please subscribe to our channel below. And if you have any additional questions, please leave them in the comments section. Thank you.